Hi, thank you everyone. So I'm Julian, uh, I'm, I'm working for Cloudflare and I will talk to you about uh, one of my latest projects there, uh, which is about Open Resty and, and Nginx and how to make it closer to Apache, but for good reason. So a few words about me. Uh, so I'm working for Cloudflare in London uh, in the Edge performance team. So we are basically looking at our systems and trying to optimize them. Uh, and before that, I was working on our HTTP proxies. Um, and I actually, I code in Lua for more than 10 years. And I started to see that language while uh, modifying a game, not World of Warcraft. It was Far Cry, if I remember correctly. But yeah, I started like that. And since then, I, I quite like this language, I, w I have to say. Um, so a few more words about what we are doing at Cloudflare. So we are providing performance and security products for website operators, which are our customers. And so we basically sit as a proxy uh, uh, between the visitors and our customers and try to optimize their websites and also black block attackers. Um, so we do that basically by looking at each request and saying if it's good or not. Um, and for the HTTP, HTTP part of that, uh, on which I will focus, we use Nginx and, and Lua a lot. Um, we also have DNS products and all the stuff, but they are only the HTTP part use Lua that heavily. Um, and it's so we, we used an, a customized version of Nginx with uh, Lua Nginx module, and we use Lua for every single request that flows through a network. Uh, and there is about um, 10 million of them at peak time per second. Um, so we use Lua to load the configuration for every website, uh, do a bunch of security check. So it's IP reputation and IP based firewall and more customized and heavy kind of firewalling. Uh, we use Lua to also find the right server to proxy the request to, to log the, all the information that we have about the request for analytics purposes and that kind of stuff. So one of the security products we have, the web application firewall, is the heaviest kind of security you can imagine. Um, so in the, uh, I will call that the WAF from now on. So it's basically a huge set of regular expressions um, that check for every request. Oh, does it look like a SQL injection? Does it look like a cross-site scripting attack? Uh, and Or is it trying to exploit some kind of previous uh, security issue, like uh, when there is a security issue with Drupal or WordPress, people start to exploit that, and we, we have rules to detect that kind of exploit. Um, so yeah, pool sets grow over time, and typically you end up with thousands of rules to process for every single request. Uh, that's quite heavy, uh, especially based on the, when you think that the, the, we, we have to check uh, for these attacks in the in the URL, in the headers, in the bodies for the of the request, uh, and so that there is a lot of data to process, and we have to do that very quickly. So mo most well, you you have firewall product that you can install directly on your own server. Um, so the most popular one is Mod Security, which run Apache, Nginx, and a few others um, for. Nginx specifically, um, there is also Naxi and, and Lua Resty WAF, which, as the name implies, it's written in Lua. Um, but at Cloudflare, we also offer that um, firewall for our customers, um, so they don't have to run that on their own infrastructure. Um, and it's, it, it was historically based on mod security. So uh, we were running Apache in our infrastructure to um, uh, to process all these requests but over time it became very complicated and well more complicated than it should be and it, it became kind of a bottleneck uh, so we at that point we tried to see what we can do about that and we ended up implement re-implementing the mod security engine in Lua to run in, in Nginx and, and take the, the mod security rules 
so that means all the regular expression and how, how to match them and transpile them to Lua. So we ended up, well, we ended up with this auto-generated code that makes PCRE for the regular expression and Lua. Um, and it, it worked well for, for years. Uh, on average, it takes uh, two to four milliseconds to process a request. Some, some requests are heavier than others to process, but it, I mean, it's, it sounds fast, but actually it's not. Uh, and it causes problems in our infrastructure because we end up having requests that slow down other unrelated requests. And I will explain how um, with that simple example. So here we have a very simple example where a client uh, is uh, issuing two requests to uh, an origin and uh, we sit in between, uh, so the two requests are kind of parallel. Um, so traditionally, um, if you use Apache or that, the kind of that kind of server, every request uh, is scheduled on a different OS level thread. Um, so if the first request arrives, it gets processed by, uh, by a thread. As a proxy, we find the origin to connect to, and we connect to that origin, and there is nothing more to do for now. Um, second request arrives, things thing happens. Um, the origin for the f for of the first requests uh, answers, so we can do more stuff, um, and so on. So we can notice a couple of things here. First, that as every request has its own thread, they can be processed at the same time. But on the other hand, as we see that proxy, well, we don't have much to do. That there is that this processing is pretty quick, uh, and the most of the thread just sit idle. Um, but as we act as a proxy, we have a lot of connections to handle, and a lot of threads. And if we keep spawning threads, um, that 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 end up having a huge override in memory because each thread has its own stack, uh, and it's at its own memory. Uh, data structure in kernel for the scheduling, uh, so that kind of stuff. And if you do that, uh, if you if we end up thousands and thousands of threads, uh, well, it's not efficient at all. So there is another approach to kind of overcome that limitation that consists of merging all the requests on the same giant event loop. Um, so it works like this. So first request, as before, uh, but the second request, when it arrives, gets scheduled on the same event loop. Um, so the, all the requests can be kind of merged together. Uh, we, we can see that then we need a single thread. But on the other hand, here, for instance, uh, when, a resp when there is a unit of work to do, sometimes it might, be, uh, it might have to wait for a bit for the event loop to be free to process it. Um, if, if we again, if we act as a proxy and every bit of processing is quick, that's not a problem at all. Um, so Nginx that we use at Cloudflare um, has used that approach, and it was, I think, the first very successful web server, uh, or at least open source one, to use it. So, uh, it, but even. Um, if we keep adding more connections, eventually the event loop is fully buzzy uh, and we have to do something else. So Nginx offers the possibility to spawn multiple worker process that each, on, each worker has its own event loop. They each are able to process new connections and they share very little states um, with each other. And it's primarily designed as a proxy or as a static file server again for because every bit of work has to be quick. Um, but yeah, if the unit of if the bits of work that we have to do are not weak, here is what's happening. Here, for instance, if I want to run the web application firewall on that request to bank.com, um, here we can see that the first request is blocked. Uh, for a long time, where it should, we should be able to process it. But no, it has to wait uh, for the WAF to be available. 
and that's uh, because once a request is accepted by um, a worker in at least the Nginx uh, uh, architecture, it can be sent to another worker that might be free at that point. Uh, the request has to stay on that one worker. Uh, yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, here uh, we we can see that the the so the blue request is stole and it shouldn't be. And it got even worse uh, if we think about the keep alive connection, where you open a single TCP connection to a server and issue multiple requests uh, over the same connection. So in HTTP one, uh, you could send one request after the other. With HTTP2, there it's all the mechanism to enable even more parallelism. Um, but here it was happening. So when you connect to a server initially, you get scheduled on any worker. But from that point on, you will stay on that worker for the entire connection lifespan. Again, because every worker is a separate process, and they can't share uh, file descriptors once they opened. Um, so here come Lua. Uh, since the beginning, I was telling that um, we use Lua at Cloudflare to do all the dynamic processing and all the business logic. And we used um, Lua Nginx module for that, which is a, a module that exists for Nginx for quite a while now. And it allows, uh, it, it embeds Lua to, in, to run hooks at different stage of processing, and with Lua, we you can use you can do that you can do complex routing, um, like you want to route one bit of your website here and one bit here, or A/B testing that kind of thing. That's very dynamic, and you can't really express that uh, with the normal Nginx configuration. You can also do ACL, uh, so access control, uh, so it's con authentication or firewalling, that kind of thing, uh, load balancing. You can do a lot of stuff. Uh, some people even use that module to implement entire applications. I wouldn't uh, advise that uh, because of all the limitation that we, we've seen. And there is better options, I think, if you want to implement entire applications. Um, you are, you, in Lua, you have CQs, which is, uh, I think, maybe a better option, even though it has the same limitations, or even other languages. Um, and also, if you want to use that, uh, I would advise to use OpenResty, which basically is a bundle of Nginx, Lua Nginx module, and a, a lot of other uh, libraries that you might need to interact with other services. So it's it's quite full-featured and a nice way to start. Um, and also, the event loop architecture maps really well with the Lua coroutines. Because in C, uh, if you write Nginx module in C, it's kind of a callback hell, where you have to say, oh yeah, I do a bit of work. Next time, call this callback. And with that structure here, um, with Lua, you don't see that at all. Basically, you just suspend a coroutine, and when the work is ready, the coroutine gets resumed, and it's transparent. So it's it's really, really easy to, to work with. Um, so, so far, what we can see is that the, um, having an event loop architecture has advantage over threads, because there is less memory overhead, less kernel scheduling overhead. But there, you have to approach that as a soft real time in the way that you have to be very careful about what you do with your CPU time uh, once you have the CPU, because there is no preemptive scheduling. You have to give the control back to the event loop at some point so it can progress. Um, and that's that's actually uh, a known problem for Nginx, uh, and especially when it's used as a static file server uh, and the, the backend file system is slow. They have this problem, uh, and they fixed it by adding thread pools uh, in the Nginx model. So how it works is that basically every worker process has its own set of threads that are used just to offload that tiny bit of work that we know might be long. So it's kind of getting the best of both worlds, where we can keep the fast processing in the event loop and the slower parties offloaded somewhere else. 
Um, and also, well, it's st it, it keeps in the same uh, kind of mind, st mind state where the worker process share very little with each other, so every process is on thread pool. So the idea that we have at Alpha at that point is that we have some CPU heavy work that we, we know might be slow. Let's just run it into a thread. Let's see if we can run Lua into a thread. So if we take our slides from before, what uh, we had that, and I wanted the scenario to look more like that, where uh, I have the first request, second request arrived, oh, I have to run the WAF there, let's over offload that somewhere else, so the event loop gets free to, pro to continue process the other requests. And then, well, the, the WAF request will still be a bit slower than the average request, but at least it won't uh, interact badly with other requests. So at, at the end, it looked a bit like that, where I define my thread pool. That's a basic, uh, that's a core Nginx directive, where uh, here I, this, I, I want to make a very over-engineered way to uppercase a string. So I will do that in a thread. Um, so I define the thread pool. I say, okay, for that thread pool, here is the processing that you will do for every task that's uh, put into it. And the contents by Lua uh, block, if you don't know, uh, if you're not familiar with Nginx, this is a way to tell Nginx how, okay, this request is handled by Lua, and here is the code to generate the answer. So here, I just take my thread pool, I push a task that gets processed here, and uh, the return value is just returned to the uh, client. So that, that's a simple example. Um, so under the hood, how it works is that every thread has its own separate VM, uh, again, because they don't, uh, to, to share as little as possible. Uh, and well, sh uh, having the same uh, Lua state across different threads uh, is not exactly the way to do it. Uh, so every thread has its own separate VM, um, and thread pools, like you've seen, are focused on doing, on doing only one task. It's pretty much like a function. Uh, if you need to do different things, you will have to spawn different thread pools. Uh, and also, one our, well, our use case was basically to take a bit of code and put into a thread without modifying it, if possible, or having very little modifications. So the API exposed is the same. Uh, that, that's thanks to the sandboxing kind of API that's offer, uh, that Lua offers. So we can just re-implement the bits that are not compatible. Uh, as long as they behave the same, the client codes basically don't see that. But some APIs are not exposed at all because it doesn't make sense. Like all the asynchronous API that use the event loop are not available in a thread. Um, and the the values, so when a value is pushed from the event loop to the thread or the other around, uh, it's serialized and then deserialized um, again to to have some memory safety. Um, so here is a more complicated example uh, that we use as a benchmark to show exactly how it solved the problems that we had. Um, so I have this very simple HTML page with two images on it and a, and a very simple style sheet. So the big image is actually uh, nearly a megabyte, and this one is a thumbnail generated on the fly by Nginx um, uh, with uh, a nice watermark. Uh, so the code looked like this: uh, if we use that, if you use a direct event loop implementation, so it's just a single function. Uh, we load the, wa the watermark at, at the, when the code is initialized, and then for every request, we just take the path, find the picture, uh, resize it, apply the watermark, and answer it. And if I run that on my laptop, I can already see that we have a problem here because the last, uh, so the last request, which is a big picture, should, that should be actually fast. 
because it's a static file. But we can see here that it's, it doesn't get processed before the thumbnail is. So it's stuck behind the, the thumbnail request. Um, so let's put that into a thread and see how it goes. The code is pretty much the same. So in the content phase, uh, we just keep the path resolution because we need the request. And then once we're the final path, we just push the task into the thread um, and leave the, the resize work happening in the thread. And here we can see already that uh, the last request is not stuck, stuck anymore uh, be behind the slow one. So let's run that at a bit uh, on a bit more uh, beefy server, let's say. So I have this massive server with 128 cores. Um, I will run a benchmark on it on 120 CPUs each time. And I will run three, uh, three benchmarks, one with 100 requests where the server is not overloaded at all. 200 simultaneous connections, the server starts to be fairly overloaded. 200 connections over 120 workers, like if, if it's like full CPU work, uh, you start having some saturation. And at 400, the server is completely saturated. And we'll see how it reacts uh, on the different cases. So um, if the, the when I will talk about a timeout or an error, it's because the server didn't manage to, to answer after 10 seconds. Uh, so here's the result. Uh, uh, here, um, I will observe a key metric for our customers and, well, for us too, is the time to first byte, which is the time it took from the moment the client sent the connection to the moment when the client started to receive the answer, the, well, the first byte of the answer, and we measure that. So that's for the small files, which is the uh, HTML and CSS file, and we can see that here, um, here we have the percentile the, of, the, of every request, so here, the 99th percentile means that 99% of requests got faster than that and 1% were, was slower. Uh, and here's the latency in milliseconds. And for the small files, which should be like super fast, like just a couple of milliseconds, especially on the if I stay on the same machine, I start having some, a lot of latency on the most extreme requests. And some, some of them even got timeouts with 400 connections. So that's, that's just for small files that should be delivered quickly all the time. So we can see here that so, um, the request got stuck be behind the, the resize request. Um, so if with the thread version, that's, that look a lot better. So <laughs> that at least that part of the problem is solved. So for the thumbnails, as expected, on the direct mode, it's the same. Uh, the more uh, the more rec the more connection we have, the more the latency will be high, and there is uh, a few timeouts here and there. So using the thread, that doesn't look too good, right? So here we we can see that with one connection, the requests uh, got handled pretty well. Not pretty quickly, but they got handled. But as soon as the servers start being very loaded, the well, the, the latency just explodes, and uh, there is a lot of errors. Uh, here we can see that the uh, yeah, using the direct event loop mode, we, we we had a few errors, but we have a lot more using threads. So so something is clearly happening there. So we, we so we did solve the problem with the static files, but we made the situation worse for the other ones. So what's happening actually uh, is caused by the way Linux handle the um, the connection, uh, because Nginx internally for Linux use EPOL, uh, which is a system call that a lot of people don't like because it's quite Quirky, quirky to use, and well, one of my colleagues wrote a series of blog articles uh, and called it fundamentally broken. I, 
I wouldn't go as far, but yeah, that w there is a few problems. And not uh, and notably here, what's happening is that when a request arrives and multiple processes are listening for new connection on on that socket, on the uh, so the kernel basically will call every process that's listening and say, "Oh, can you accept the connection?" No, you you or oh, you can accept. You got the connection. But he will, the kernel will do that only, uh, always in the same order. So w when we use the direct event loop implementation or even a thread-based approach, it's not a problem because if the thread is busy resizing a picture, it won't accept new connections. But as we offloaded all that work into a thread, no, the event loop is free, uh, is has a lot more free time, so it will happily accept more and more connections, and then find out later, oh, no, actually, I can't process that. Um, so here, you can see the CPU usage of the different, uh, of the different processes. Um, this is what's happening. That worker got all the load, that one has a tiny bit of it, and all the others are just sitting idle. Um, so the, again, the, the Nginx architecture of sharing nothing across workers it doesn't make our life easy here. Uh, there is other approaches that are more complicated, but Nginx wants to keep things simple for its use case, which is proxying. And clearly, here we don't do that anymore. We we use basically Nginx for something it wasn't really meant to to do. So there is kind of a band-aid uh, that's available out of the box. That's use reuse ports. So it's a TCP option. Uh, for listening sockets, where that's initially uh, was meant to allow multiple processes to bind the same port uh, and accept connections without being related. But what's interesting is that the kernel creates a new accept queue for every listening connection, and we load balance the connection across them uh, before uh, the process can actually accept the new the new request. So in our case, it's it's very good because it means that the kernel will load balance the, the work beforehand. And we can see here that all the CPU are busy or they should be. So the results for the small files are still pretty good, so it doesn't change. And for the thumbnails, we can see that uh, yeah, it, it, it's also a lot better uh, with wanted connection, so the non-saturated case, uh, it's actually a bit quicker. Here on the 200 connection, uh, we still have a few errors, which is expected because the servers start to be overloaded, but a lot less on the 400 connection. It's just like, it's, there, there is nothing we can do about that. So if we summarize, we can see that the, the error rate on the 200 connection case is a lot lower, and the static files are still delivered quickly. So it's kind of uh, it, it kind of fixed the problems. Um, so that's well, uh, that's good enough for now. So what we can do about that is that thre using threads won't magically unlock uh, more CPU power. Uh, if your server is saturated, you you will have to find a new way to handle your problems, like either optimize your code, buying more servers, I don't know, but threads won't save you. But if you uh, if if you know what you're doing with uh, with the workload you have, you can just selectively offload the bits of work that you don't that you don't want outside of the event loop, and it, it will make the f it will keep the fast request fast. But well, we we have this issue with people, sadly. Uh, which, by the way, uh, I think it's only Linux specific. I haven't tested uh, the BSD family. Uh, but I, from what I s know, the asynchronous uh, network is a lot better there. Um, but so okay. So what about the the WAF, which are, which was our use case initially? How how does it behave at the end? Um, so we ended up uh, giving a every Nginx worker a few WAF worker to offload the request to. And we and the queue the, the task queue uh, when we push a, a WAF 
a WAF task is actually very small. Uh, it's on purpose, uh, so we can still uh, fall back to the previous mode, which was to run that on the event loop. When the server gets too busy, it's, uh, it's kind of a way to um, ha handle the situation a bit more nicely than just putting requests on a queue forever. Um, so the argument passing, we basically prepare all the or all the data that the WAF might need into a table that gets serialized and deserialized, and same for the answer. But the, here the answer is actually pretty pretty obvious. I mean that, that that's why we also focus on the WAF because it's it's kind of a pure function. It's like here is your inputs. Just tell me yes or no. Uh, so it was a very good case for thread offloading. And also, uh, we use uh, a custom kernel patch that kind of overcome the EPOL issue by doing run robin on the uh, on the worker on all every process rather than all calling them always on the on the same order. Um, so here is the the actual result from production. So here I'm comparing over 24 hour periods one week apart, the result before and after we we introduced the, the uh, threaded WAF. Um, the green line here is the request without uh, the WAF enabled. So we can see that they are pretty much the same. That's expected. And the yellow line is the request for which we have the WAF. Uh, so this compare the time uh, a request blocked the event loop, the longest time the request blocked the event loop. So we can see that the WAF one are about 25 to 30% lower. That's, that's nice, but actually our customers don't care about that uh, because what they care about is not how we handle the, the request at kernel level. It's how, how we can deliver response faster. So let, let's have a look at that. So that's the time to first byte only for cached, uh, for cached request because if we have to go to the origin, we, we don't really control all the chain. So it, it gets a bit more uh, noisy. Uh, and here again, so the green line is still the request without the WAF and the yellow line with the WAF. And again, we can see a pretty big win on the non-WAF request again on the 25 to 30 percent range while the WAF requests are also a bit faster uh, less but still a bit faster so the reason why they are faster and it wasn't the goal initially uh, to make them faster it's because uh, well the WAF requests also get blocked behind all the WAF requests and um, and also because now as I mentioned every worker has multiple threads so it has more CPU to burn Another metric that improved uh, is the accept latency, which is the time it took for uh, the for Nginx to accept a new connection, and that's uh, we can see like nearly four, like 30, 40 percent win here. So in conclusion, um, so we we are working into open sourcing that module, so other people can also. Uh, use that to run Lua in threads, at, at least for with Nginx. Um, it's not there yet. We are discussing with the Open Rusty community because to do that, I had to use, I had to do many hacks and modify a tiny bit the, the, Lua, the Lua Nginx module. Um, so it, it's, it's in progress. It's not there yet. Um, oh, also, only the, the request response pattern is implemented. Like I push, uh, uh, I push a task. I'm waiting for the answer. There is other tasks that we can think about, like, um, like fire and forget. Like just like do that whenever. I don't care. Um, yeah, the, that data serialization is simple and safe, but it also creates a lot of copies, especially when you have a lot of data, it can be a bit of a bottleneck. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we tested that only on Linux because this is what we run in our infrastructure. Um, but while well, there is a few non portable calls, but it's not uh, porting that on BSD or Windows shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, and yeah, there is issue with 
ePoll and balance uh, that we, we have we had to fix uh, at the kernel level because well it, we use all the on the reason that we use a lot of Unix socket internally and reuse port is a TCP option so you can't use that with uh, Unix sockets. So that's pretty much it for me. Uh, I put all the links I mentioned on on this URL if you are interested. Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you, Julian. And uh, question, please. Hello. Yeah. Uh, hi there. Uh, I'm interested from uh, architecture perspective. You mentioned that every thread uh, uses its own Lua virtual machine. Yeah. So I'm I'm interested in how long uh, does it take to start virtual machine and how long this virtual machine lives. Is it uh, bind to to thread its all and the thread until the thread dead? become dead, a uh, virtual machine will be lived. Oh, uh, so actually, no, the, the VM is spawned only when the, thread, uh, at the when the thread is initialized. And after that, it can process many tasks. Uh, after that, I added another directive to reset the state after, let's say, 50,000 connections. That's mm -hmm. to avoid memory fragmentation, mm -hmm. uh, because we're using LuaJIT, which has a fairly limited garbage collector. Uh, so yeah, so ba basically, yeah, the the VM once it's spawned, process many requests. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you have any problems with Lua garbage collector because I think that uh, back in 2015, uh, Engine Script was introduced in uh, Nginx to work around uh, the problem when garbage collector suddenly freezes the whole system. Do you have any, anything such, no, anything like that? And did you try using Engine Script? Um, so we we haven't. Uh, well, the, it's true that the garbage collector, when it kicks in, kind of stalls the event loop. Uh, in practice, it's not that often, uh, and uh, the poles are rather limited. Uh, we no, we we haven't started to use uh, Nginx script uh, mainly because we have such a massive Lua code base now that it would be kind of uh, a very hard task. Okay, thank you. More questions, please. Hi. Thanks, uh, Lucien. Uh, uh, there is an edge triggered mode in EPOL. Uh, does it fix the fundamentally broken stuff of EPOL? Uh, the what do you mean the the reuse port option? No, uh, I mean uh, EPOL has edge triggered mode. Yeah. Uh, does it fix the issue or it doesn't at all? Not really. Uh, the yeah, the, the the fact that the kernel kind of try to wake the process in the same order all the time is really the the problem. Uh, there was also another option that has been added a few years ago, which is the EPOL exclusive mode, where where it tries to wake a single process instead of all of them at the same time. Um, but yeah, again, the the this kind of unbalance is really. Um, I mean, I, you you will have uh, you will have that no matter what you do. Uh, so exclusive mode also doesn't help the issue. Not really. No. Okay. Thank you. It, it's more meant into like, I, if you use the traditional thread-based approach, it will fix the problem because, as I said, if a worker is not in equal weight, it won't be weighted by the kernel. So if it's if it's buzzy, uh, it's fine. But otherwise, uh, you will have that issue. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, one question about actually, not about Lua, but about the approach you used for offloading tasks. Uh, what about, let's say, running another process, let's say, written in Golang or other uh, language targeted to threading, actually, instead of Nginx, and actually talk to it with uh, Unix socket or whatever on local host, just to 
send the tasks to th this process and uh, use the traditional for Nginx approach to uh, pull around and get the result after this some time afterwards. So it's true that, yeah, that's the traditional approach, uh, just to offload that to another worker, uh, to another process. Uh, we, so we, we do that for, like, uh, we have dynamic resizing of picture, like the benchmark that I showed, we do that in other processes. But for the WAF, it's extremely time sensitive. Uh, we have to get as quick as possible. And going to another process, uh, in practice, the, the latency added is a, is unacceptable. I mean, if you know that your work will be extremely long, yeah, there is definitely a better approach, I think. But here, the, most of the requests are processed in just a couple of milliseconds, and then staying in the same process is, is faster. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Julian. Thank you.